afternoon, everyone. Um, we have this session and we have a slightly delayed start, but nevertheless, we'll press on and we will try to complete it on time. I have two very exciting uh, talks and uh, that's both to do with the kind of uh, the documentation effort and the kind of uh, bringing together this sort of huge, uh, potentially huge results on heritage. Uh, first, I have Dr. Fadil Fadli, who is the, uh, the head of architecture at Qatar University. And he's talking about digitizing built heritage towards the use of HBIM in Qatar. Fadil. Thank you, Sherman. Thanks for the quick presentation. I will not introduce myself. I already did in the morning. Also, the presentation, if you look at the cover page, I added the digital part, which is the drawings. So briefly, we will talk about what is the built heritage, what is digitizing, how we can use what we call HBIM, heritage or historic building information modeling in Qatar and in the region. Uh, briefly, we have four I would say five, five sections in the presentation. So we will develop on the built heritage, the context of Qatar. I think we had uh, very good presentations this morning talking about the evolution of uh, the chronological evolution of certain cities in the Gulf, like in Oman. Uh, we had another talking about different cities in uh, the Gulf region as well. So we will look at uh, Qatar, Doha mainly. Why do we digitize what and how? And then we will look at the BIM, Building Information Modeling, this new technology, this new technique, this new process, this new tool, and how we can use it to safeguard, to preserve this uh, vanishing heritage, either built, tangible, or non-built, intangible. And then we see the applications were done through a small project done a couple of years ago, back 2012, 2013, with uh, students as well. And we see future prospects, how we can evolve. So this work will, uh, was mainly done based on the, of the Europe grant again. It's a small grant, about $30,000 that time, but it built up on work I have carried on before when I was in Liverpool School of Architecture, also when I moved to Doha about uh, eight years ago almost. And I started, I had a small grant from the university, so I thought why not digitize the, the heritage which exists in Qatar mainly the architectural heritage, the built heritage, but also anything going with it. And uh, so the, the customs, the us, and how we will work on this and how we will develop the skills, the capacities, capacity building of locals, of experts, of architects, of decision makers in doing so. We all know that heritage resources are very important, as, as important as a chain tying up the past, the future, through the present. Uh, Nader talked about the GSD project on the sustainable golf urbanism, where they worked on phase one, but they were unlucky to manage phase two, phase three because of funding. We cannot talk about the past without looking at what we are living now and where are we going. This is very important. We can record, we can digitize, but if we don't know what we are doing with those records, we will not know how to digitize them, how to record them, how to save them. So this is very important. Also, we usually look at heritage when this heritage is vanishing. We don't consider it when it's there, when it's existing. And we were discussing yesterday in a, in a very well uh, focused meeting with the team on the proposal in itself. And we were the, discussing that the, the, the time range, the period of the recording will span from 1700 to 1960. And I told Shoman, probably here in Qatar, we have to expand it even further. It would be 1980, probably 1990. We don't know, because this heritage, depending on the eye of the person looking at it, it could span over time. And we should not wait until this heritage is really becoming vulnerable that we have to do the recording and the digitizing. So we have to start from now. And that's why the change in perceptions and how we look at this uh, importance is leading us to more focus in how defining those activities. And Qatar is one of those countries witnessing, we know about the oil, I, I will not go into too much history, I will show for you slides, and we see how it developed. This is just graphically done through different authors throughout uh, the timing and how, how the city has grown in a different manner through the coast, but also inside, through the inland. And you can see through the mapping, 
you have the different polynuclease between 1959, 73, 1988, and so on. So it is really developing very fast, and this is today from the Aspire Tower on the top. It's sprawling all over. If we don't do something to existing heritage, to dilapidated heritage, we will not find nothing. This will just go this way. I took this photo back, I think, 2010, November, December, near Meshireb, what is now the developments. We were demolishing what was not considered heritage that time, which could be considered heritage now. This is very important. And we had this as well. There are many photos. I have series of photos where you span everything. And it's still happening. You can drive through and you can see it. We are demolishing some parts which represents history of Qatar, which represents history of the city of Doha and other cities like al Wakra or al Khur. We, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, Muhammad Abdullah here. I used this photo. You gave us a lecture back in that time, I remember. And this was developed, an artistic depiction, on one of the shops in the souk, if I recall well. So through what we were discussing this morning, you can meet with people, with grandparents, as another said, with the parents and probably future generations. They will tell you how the house was, how the shop was, but we don't have the perfect recording, we don't have the perfect drawings, but still we can manage to develop something. This was just a depiction. We are not at the account of Edmond Poti or Ecochard, but it might happen if we do not act very quickly. This was based on the work I did that time with the group of students, so there might have been some more accounts between 2013 and now, but I stopped at that time and the origins of Doha with uh, Rob Carter and his team. And I ranked all the work which has been done going down to the Danish mis mission back in 1950s where there have been different types of buildings from residential, commercial, religious, military, and also conservation areas. And we started spotting who worked on what, what was there at what, and what was not. And we ended up finding that there was not major studies until the 80s. They were very sparse, very scarce, and they were sporadic. Then there was more interest, and since the start of the new millennium, which is about 20 years ago, there is more interest because we have noticed that the heritage is disappearing, the built heritage is disappearing over here. There have been new rules, new laws, with emery decrees to protect all this. Still, we are facing this vanishing. I can record, our colleague Ibrahim is not here, but one of his book, The History of Qatari Architecture, was one of those very important uh, publications and records. There was the GHD survey of old buildings in the state of Qatar back in the, uh, 2004, and Ibrahim and Malika Bornan built on it to develop the, the book they did, but also there was Al Khulefi work back in 2000, 2006, in two different versions. So there is more and more interest in recording this architecture, vernacular architecture, traditional architecture, and how can we save it. I just bring this what we discussed in the morning. We have primary versus secondary data. Do we go by ourselves and record what is there before it disappears, or we collect the books we had, whichever on Qatar, on Yemen, on Iraq, on Saudi Arabia, and then build up our digital uh, database, like for the project. <clears throat> so this will lead us to different aspects. How do we do? How do we record it? How do we collect this data? How do we synthesize this data and treat it. So there might be some issues. This is the team I've been working on. It was three students back in 2011, 2012. They all graduated now. They are working, a couple of them, in the Supreme uh, Committee of Legacy and Delivery. Another one works with HSBC Bank. And this is where we met Ibrahim. He has his private collection. So I'm informing Schumann and James. I'm sure you know about it. He has many titles in his uh, own library many documents and a lot of records. And we started working, so we visited sites. We visited sites which were under renovation, reconstruction, restoration, you name it. There are different actions when you want to safeguard this vanishing heritage. We also looked at different types of buildings, military accommodate, uh, housing or accommodation, religious, spiritual, and so on. So we have a huge amount of photographies. 
and different ones. This was in Al Khor. And we started working in a very empirical way, using triangulation, the old system. We didn't know about 3D scanning, or we knew about it, but it was very expensive. We couldn't access this. So we started working in a very conventional way, measured uh, drawings, taking photographies, using photogrammetries, and we started elaborating what we did. We did our own drawings, and we compared them to existing ones. Have there been any differences? And we found out there have been differences because there have been changes in some of the buildings. Not all of them, we couldn't track everything, but we take, take some couple of ones and we worked on them, like El Solaiti um, House or Khutba Mosque. Some have vanished, some have disappeared. And that's why we started thinking, how can we use a digital platform to reunite all these uh, vanished records, vanished buildings? <coughs> Sorry and also reduce the vulnerability, vulnerability risks at the early recording stages. So BEAM, we can consider it, is embedded every day in design practices and operations. And this is one of these operations in restoring a building, in reusing a building, in creating an adaptive reuse and rehabilitation. And if you see, these are two different uh, aspects where we have the BEAM tools and then we have the environmental information. We need to know about the performance of the building, how this building is reacting after 500, 600, probably 20 years only. So we can manage this and we can use it as a relation between the LCA and the BIM. I'll go quickly through this uh, theoretical uh, aspects of BIM so we will know how we could generate 3D models from sensor data dispatched over a scene. Instead of using just the conventional method, we could be using 3D scanners or other types, probably aerial drones, very small machines, which can be manipulated from ground and they can overtake uh, elements based on sensorial uh, systems. Just a graphic display. Are we having an as-built or as is card drawings, depending on what are the availabilities? We were discussing with Samia, I don't know if she's here, yes. At that time you said about mentioning the flexibility of a building. How can we change it? This is very important because we can record the building at state A, but after 10 years, 20 years, it will change to state B. Who would tell us that A or B is the original function? So we can compare between two and have more dynamic instead of a static information, which could move over time or we could manipulate and uh, integrate in the system. Again, we can have them in a way how to capture these facilities. It could be modern buildings, it could be historic buildings, but it will work all the same. What we did, we looked at different usage of uh, 3D captures. This is after the project ended, so we acquired a 3D scanner in the department and we started working on modern buildings, but we tried some historic buildings. And this is the way on how you could, uh, this is not in Qatar, this was a trial with uh, some colleagues, and it works on the 3D aspects of different heritage. Board. And it compares the digital photogrammetry with the laser scanning. They both have pros and cons, and you can use them both combined to have a better outcomes. These are, again, different aspects where you can use drones in collecting data. It could be in Zubara or it could be in any place in Qatar because you will have a more uh, complete imagery of the site rather than when you go and maneuver on the ground. But again, these are all new technologies and how we can adapt them. So the 3D scanner could be one of those uh, very quick, fast uh, spreading technologies and the prices are reducing so we can get it used. The only issue is after the data capture, you can have huge amounts of data, millions and millions of data, what we call the point cloud, and you will have millions to treat. So after that, how would you treat these point clouds? What will you keep? What will you remove? And bearing in mind, this is just the tangible part the tangible part of the heritage of the building, which is the physical components. We don't know what's inside, we don't know how it has been developed and so on. So it can be developed further, and that's what we did. I'll go back to the project. This was very simple. We tried to check how we develop a database based on different types. If I go with the mouse here, I don't know. if you see the, the row of blocks, we have forts or military palaces, houses, mosques, souks, 
and different villages. So we started to record from secondary and from primary. Sometimes you went to site to check about those pri uh, secondary data, to check if the building or the site is still existing. We reached this large database with different coding. Uh, I think the red was vanished or dilapidated. The yellow was in very advanced dilapidation state. There was still some uh, traces of the building or the site. And the green was either restored, closed, or restored, reused. So depending on the type of building. And this was the database. We used the FileMaker as software, where we moved from the generic part, which is the map of Qatar, and we located all the existing recorded sites and buildings. I think we counted 79 at that time. And then we linked each point, which is a GIS point. We don't have it here, but it's work, ongoing work, where once you click on the point, you will have the information of the site. From the site, you go to the building, and then you go inside. So it works like this, and you can work, and you have different uh, data. And we linked it to photographic uh, recording, digital photographies. This can be added where we will have CAD drawings, we will have 3D models, and we will include even the BIM models with the new technologies. Again, you can list them. You can make the selection, as you see, by cities. We listed six cities that time. Doha, Al-Wakr, Al-Khur, Shamal, Dukhan, Um Salah, Al-Muhammad, and then the building type. So you can select Doha, what type of buildings, palaces, and the list of palaces will come out. And from there, you will know the condition of the palace, I mean the building, and you can access it. This was, uh, obviously, it's El Merweb Fort. Some of them disappeared completely, but we used existing data, secondary sources, and we included them in database. So, very quickly, this is uh, briefly the map. I think I'm on time, yeah, with the listing. And then we ended up comparing with the different previous studies. Yeah, we reached 72, including found, but not surveyed. We couldn't survey everything. We couldn't collect everything, but we put it the, the work has not been fully published, so there is ground for expansion and using more technologies like drawings either existing or we still go on site to conduct those. Compare between existing records and updated records. We can use, as I said, modern technologies like 3D scanning, then redevelop the 3D uh, BIM model and include all the data, useful and non-useful could be data which is not useful now, but it could be useful after 10 years, after five years. So we can collect what we call in the jargon of the beam, sorry for the word, rubbish data. So you collect everything, it could be millions of millions of points, and then you select what is needed. And uh, for future prospects, we can develop different actions on this, going from preservation, restoration, conservation, rehabilitation, reconstruction, adaptation, and we have couple of actions happened in Qatar based on this, where we had either restoration and it was allowed, or it was partially allowed, and also reconstruction in some uh, aspects and in some souks, mainly. This is some work done in different parts of the world. I tried to collect, and they use the H-beam, which is typically for heritage buildings, information modeling. And there have been studies uh, this part is when we use the scanner and we try to apply it on existing uh, sites, not in Qatar, and see how we develop the 3D. And then link all the, what we call families, and you will have furniture, internal furniture, external furniture, you will have landscaping, you will have water feature, you will have types of materials used, uh, you name it. You can list all the data, you, and you can create what we call IFCs. These are interoperability families, and you can exchange between software and different uh, uh, platforms. This was used in Jeddah. It's called H Jeddah HBM on a PhD thesis at UCL, and where they started developing uh, certain elements. You can go at very deep, uh, at the depth of the details of the window or the materials or the mushrabia used in those windows, and you can develop it further and link with the different uh, categories of data collected. So we can use the same in Qatar, based on what we have. We can even go further. Walking in the souk, 
we noticed uh, there have been some materials which are not corresponding to the original materials of uh, the building itself. We can re redesign, rebuild, or reconstruct those vanished materials. And we can use robotic and 3D printing as over here. And that's the, the cloud we got from the original uh, digital, uh, how do we say, uh, stored data. And then you can develop the materials based on the char chemical characteristics. And this is very advanced, but it can be used on a house probably, and then it can be developed further. So there is prospect of a lot of work to be done. And we can, I will close with this quote, like preserving traditional architecture using modern techniques. There is nothing against bringing the past with the future through the present. Thank you. We'll take questions right at the end, uh, but if you can follow swiftly to Chris of, Chris of Graz, who is uh, from Heidi Spa in Florence, Italy, who is going to talk about HCK, a new approach methodology for georeferenced on-site surveys. Chris of. Thank you very much. Um, so I will be introducing uh, one approach that have been that has been developed through different examples, uh, which is sky, which three years ago when it was when it started was very revolutionary, but which spreads out quite a bit since that time, and uh, is one of the ways for the future inventories to be completed. So it's uh, an illustration of another technological capacity that is at hand at the moment for us to move uh, in an effective way on inventories and surveys of all kinds. Let me check if it works. Sorry. Yes, so basically I'm coming from a private company. Uh, I'm a project director within uh, Hidia Spa, which is basically dealing with heritage through a department uh, where architects and engineers deal with the restoration, conservation, uh, inventories, surveys, um, all kinds of studies and analysis all around the world, but uh, also in Italy. And it's uh, quite active since 93 for many big projects for the World Bank, for the EU, and international donors and actors. The company basically has four different departments. It's, I'm not going to spend too much time over this, be rest assured. Uh, there is one uh, architecture and construction department, another on infrastructures and engineering, another one department on environmental and management, and I'm there with the cultural heritage and culture where we deal with uh, inventories, uh, conservation and restoration, management, museum exhibitions, cultural industries, policies, and tourism. And uh, I have to say that this transversal, the four departments work very well together because in each of the cultural heritage projects, we have to tackle issues related to the, either the environment, either the infrastructures, either uh, the architectural and construction aspects, and so it's very interconnected as a structure. And it's mostly technical, that means uh, it's 70 people overall. Uh, we have the main offices in, in Italy, and I, I deal with, uh, I'm managing the Brussels office, and we have a few other offices uh, elsewhere. But uh, basically, it's very uh, technical as 90% of the staff is either engineers or uh, architects, so it's very uh, operational. Now, this is the main, the tool I'm going to discuss and present, and it's uh, I called it, we called it HCK uh, Heritage uh, uh, Kit, basically, uh, and it's uh, methodology for georeference on-site heritage surveys of all kinds. So it's very operational, as I will try to introduce you to the thing. So there we go. Uh, this is the objectives of the tool as they were defined at the beginning and it's also related to the qualities of the tool. The first objective was to facilitate uh, the way to capture data. You need to improve the speed, the convenience and the accuracy of the data collection 
and the monitoring on survey on the field and its recording. That means basically you will see through the illustrations, but uh, we mostly use either tablets, uh, simple tablets and where the forms are, or uh, even mobile phones to gather all the information where you can actually record pictures. Well, I will introduce later what you can do, but we can do about everything with them at the moment. Uh, it's also meant to improve the quantity and the accuracy of the information uh, because the collected information, as you know, is usually giving us a lot of trouble uh, in terms of management when we bring it home. Uh, and uh, we have to deal with the size of it, of the information because we don't know exactly uh, how to manage huge files and so on. And the improvement goes also through this system to make things lighter and more effective in terms of distribution of the different files and informations. Uh, you basically, well, when it's written there at the bottom, optimizing the management, it's also related to the, this uh, aspect because you have on one side the management of the heavy files, pictures, videos, and so on. We, and on the other side, you have the management of the lighter information, which is organized through databases on Excel-based formats, and that can be transformed later on the GIS, or all kinds of exploitation tools, analysis tool. And it's usually uh, very connected uh, at the moment of the entry level. Um, if you organize the information basically very well at the entry level on the site, you almost have nothing to do left at the end. You can get all the information and the, the, the queries at the very end of the process immediately, as soon as the information is submitted through the web. So the best is to show my presentation basically goes through examples. So this is basically just a brief description of the process. Uh, it starts from the heritage mapping, and we use the OpenStreetMap as a reference map because it's an open source material and it's developing, and it's allowing for the information to be put on the map and to actually build the map as long as you go ahead and to bring information to the map, and like a Google Map, for example, where you don't have polygons on Google Maps, so you don't actually put some data on the map which is possible there with OpenStreetMap because everything has polygons attached, so you can assign a lot of attributes, uh, data to one parcel or one plot or one street or whatever. Uh, then goes the heritage description, that's the files. Then you go through the basic documentation and that's where you can actually add all these levels at the entry level, uh, all these informations. You I mean, we, we use this for the identification of pathologies. Uh, you can put on the maintenance procedures and analysis, the maintenance history and planification. That means it's good for the follow-up of the works as well. It's very useful for technical document database because you can register and record all the documents that you already have or that you produce. You can also use it for cost controls cost control um, and also distributes the staff and the companies involved and the reporting. It's, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it, but at the moment in our company, we use it, we develop the tool also for the people, the engineers and architects who go on site on the building works and uh, regularly they record the progress of the works and the state of the works, the pathologies, the problems directly on the tablets and when they go home, they don't have anything else to do than to just submit on the web and to the office and they don't have to write a report. The report is already automated with the pictures and with all the information attached. So it's quite handy in this process. It's still ongoing through different developments. Then uh, you have the monitoring surveys and of course this is a very useful tool for maintenance because at the end you can, every, every time you record there is a date attached and you can uh, assign the, 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 the documentation to the date when it was done and to the place where it was done through the GPS coordinates. That means that at the end, all the information on the same place is found through the GPS coordinates of the place and you have all the dates where it, when it was surveyed and you can connect it, even analyze it through the maps and so on. This is again, the, so this is basically, I'm not going to go too much into details because it would take too much time, but this is uh, just explaining the different process on how you look, uh, you find yourself on the map with the GPS-based 
uh, in your tablet or your, on your mobile phone. And on the map, you find your location as you usually see yourself uh, you, with your, your mobile phones, the uh, orange dots there. And from then on, you can access uh, directly to the map uh, or an open street map within your uh, tablet and design your own polygon, so, which if it doesn't exist, so if there is no specified uh, parcel or building uh, on, on the open street source uh, material, you go and you draw your own parcel and then you can attach things, attributes, names, whatever, and make it exist on the web. And the moment you come home later, you, you, will, you will enter internet and on the World Wide Web, if you go to OpenStreetMap, you will find the building that you recorded uh, with the name, in, um, the name of the building and the, the plot itself. So it's, it's also a way to build on the information on the maps. Uh, the process was, uh, we, we started developing the thing um, with quite little means uh, through a, a project in Congo, in the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, where we were asked to survey the, uh, the heritage in six different cities scattered around Congo, big cities, with uh, planning departments and people we trained on this tool had for some of them, or for most of them, no clue about the computers. They had never touched any computer before in their life. They had, for some of them, not even any understanding of a map, of what the map was. They thought the map in the mayor's office was a drawing, and they didn't understand what it was for some of them. So actually, they were, it's just an anecdote, but it's quite representative of the level of information they had. When I was showing the map of the Congo, uh, a place next to the Congo River, I was showing the big blue line on the right side of the map, taking half of the map because the river is quite wide. And they were uh, saying, this is the River Congo, as if a bird was flying over the city and looking at this big stripe. And they were saying, no, no possible. It's not the River Congo. The River Congo is not blue, it's brown. And this, <laughs> this just to give you an idea about how, what's the length between the state they were in, uh, in terms of knowledge, and in one week, where they achieved. They achieved, basically, in one week of training, they managed uh, to be self-sufficient and cap capable of doing the inventory on site. So it's very uh, user-friendly and handy as a material. Now I'm more focusing, and I will develop, uh, we went on, and I, we developed the tool and adjusted it for Palestine in a place named as Samoa next to Hebron, uh, Al-Wakil, I think, Wakil in Arabic. And uh, in Samoa, the need was for a pre-diagnosis. So we, they wanted to have a first diagnosis of the houses, of the heritage houses they had, to get more uh, information about the emergency measures that needed to be taken care of. And so the survey was done with not so many places to go to, but with much more information to put. And we developed, the, we adjusted the survey in this line, and this is the process I'm going to introduce. For those who don't know the place, uh, basically, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's basically what I'm saying, but um, the Hoshes, the Awash, Ahwash, are basically family houses, and when you have uh, children, they usually uh, build a new cell next to the original cell, cell house, and there are cells growing around from like a basically a uh, nant house. It's growing very organically around the courtyard usually, and uh, on the different levels. So we had very complex shapes and complex buildings and lots of information to put, and, uh, but with limited number of buildings still. So this is the, basically the process we went through. So we adapted the level of description. We reached six levels of information. So we go, uh, you decide with one hosh, you have eight buildings, for example. Within building A, you have four walls. Within one wall, you have three windows. And within the windows, each window is documented for the materials, the size, the pathologies, and so on. And you can even go one level more on some of the issues, for example. 
And uh, then there is the field assessments, the, then there is the correction on the world files through Google Docs. Uh, the fourth step comes to the moment when you link the files to the map and you put the website in place where for interactive uh, uh, access to the information. And the fifth one is basically the use of the online database and the exploitation of the data through GIS, through other means, through all kinds of uh, uh, analytical tools. The, this is the first process. So before you go on site, uh, you adapt the, full, the, the, the survey tools and you prepare some documentation and that's when Basically, you do what I saw before on other works. Uh, you give names and numbers to the places uh, where to go to. You uh, make a rough sketches to identify the names and numbers of the courtyards of the buildings and so on. And then when you are on site, you can definitely refer to the right places continuously. Uh, the form is, uh, as I mentioned, it allows for different levels of information and it's quite handy. Um, I will show you in the next phase during the field assessments. So you actually, from this moment on, you go on site and you actually, uh, as this was done during a training of the teams in Asamoa municipality, uh, basically you go on the site with the tablets or with the mobile phone and you fill in the form. Uh, directly. Uh, the forms are basically recorded on the, on the tablets or the phone and you can access, uh, you, f you have different ways of recording the information. I just added, so you have people working on the top left and bottom right. Uh, the bottom right is also a training, the top left it's one guy actually working and recording one hosh. As you see the structures are quite uh, can be quite big and complex to documents, but it works quite well. And then I've added the two examples of the local architecture to give an idea about what, where it could be happening. Um, I, I will show you examples of the form now, but basically there is two things to differentiate in the process. Uh, the entry level, entry form, which looks really like a form where everything is pre-recorded. You have lists of um, fixed list of numbers. When you talk about periods, you set yourself uh, the different ages and periods that you want to uh, associate the buildings with, for example. And you have to think a bit before when you adjust the survey at the entry level. And when you are on site, you just have to select which period it is. And it's, you don't have to think if it's 86, 89. Uh, you have a period which relates usually to the style or the influences that take place there. And the same goes for everything. Basically, the pathologies are already pre-recorded and you always have an open entry for completion of, uh, if you don't find whatever you want in the pre-recorded list, you have an, an open entry. Uh, I mean, I've been experiencing it a lot myself. It's very handy because you can spend, you spend much less time than when you work with uh, written material and photographs and cameras, you only have one tool. You can take pictures, you can take videos, you can record. Uh, it works very well for intangible heritage, so you can record the mason which is working there and ask him to discuss the techniques he's using. You can uh, yourself record yourself and with a speech recognition in English, it works very well. It works less well in Arabic. It works, but not so well. You have a lot of corrections to do. In English, for example, it works perfectly. You can actually speak yourself to the tablet and write 10 or 15 lines of uh, information in a few seconds. Uh, so the, the, this is the entry level. It looks really like an entry form to fill in very fast. And you, when you come home, you submit the form whenever you have Wi-Fi or when you have access to the internet. It is sending your form to the web, to the web, and then you can uh, upload it immediately through, anybody can upload it through Google Doc or through Google or through any, any kind of uh, web server. And uh, that's when you can actually edit the form, add information, correct, attach other information and so on. At this point, I want to say it's something that is all the information that is automated that you put before you submit the form is 
uh, automatically linked to the database. That means you don't have anything to do. It's all automated in the right place and with keywords associated. Everything is connected in a huge Excel sheet that is automated. Uh, the moment you enter the form, of course, the new corrections that you do through Word are not automated. So it's better to actually come home if you have some additional information. You complete the additional information. You look for the ownership. You complete, uh, if you have archival documents, you can attach them to your form by taking pictures of the archival documents, adding them to your form, uh, commenting them. You do all as much as possible. You complete the form before you submit it. And therefore, all the information that you will do will be automated. Once you started, automated the form, you can complete it. There is a process also to add uh, the completions to the Excel data sheet, but you have to go through hundreds of rows and lines of data sheet to find the right spot to add the information, and it's more heavy then. So it's better to do it before. But still, uh, once you completed your form, you can put a nice format, you select the automation format also ahead where you put all the logos. You'll see this was for the British Council, so we had uh, all the logos automated. So when the form comes out, it's already put in the right format with the logos and the names and so on. And uh, basically, at this stage, it's more about editing. So this is the way it looks. Uh, for example, the teams were on the site, and I was in Brussels. I received all these files. And we design codes. You see there are Vs in front of some of the files at the bottom. They put Vs when they were validated the, by the reviewer, which was myself in this case. But uh, I put a V, and that means it's finalized, and it can be put on the map. And then the, uh, we put them later on the map. But basically, this is way it, way, the way it looks. This is the list, and then you open one, and you complete the, the, the forms. This is the exit form. This is the way it looks. This is, I mean, you can design the way you want for these forms, basically. The map is automated, but you can decide also which scale you want it to. Everything can be actually uh, designed ahead the way you want it. And uh, you see the different, you can circulate through the different chapters on the left. I'm almost done. Uh, this is basically the editing room where uh, we did in Palestine, we discussed the edition of the file. So we basically were all together and discussing, what sh was this done right? Was this done wrong? And we could argue about the level of difficulties, the level of uh, threat that was happening in the cases. And also for the training purposes, it was quite handy at the beginning. Uh, then we can, at this stage, it's the one person at, in the office in the municipality puts the files to the map, adds them on the map, links uh, the files to the map, and it can be made available for the public. Can be, some of the information can be kept for the municipality, for example, or for the state, or whatever. You can actually do whatever you want. It's really a very handy tool in the sense that you can, uh, in the process of one week, uh, adapt it to whatever, whatever you need. More time allows for more refinements. The more time you take at the beginning to define things, the lists, the, the criterions, the better it is because then you save so much time in the process. Then everything is automated. And uh, of course, based on the map, using the map and so on, you can uh, uh, design the website with interactive access to the different files and the images that you want. Well, this is an example for, it's actually, in, I think it's online, or it will be soon, the one on the hoshes. So you see that there, there is a green, pot, uh, green dot at the bottom, somewhere around 84E. Uh, now there is going to be more and more green dots as, as the more we go, the more they will turn green, uh, because th that means that there is a f finalized file attached to it. So you can actually follow up, and you have uh, access to the files this way. You can access them in JPEG, in PDF, print them, save them, record them, whatever. And of course, this is the final stage. This is the raw data that you can be exporting through GIS, through, uh, through whatever tool you use to analyze the data. You can make calculations, the average 
size of the plots, the uh, most common name of the owners, the um, average size of the uh, house, whatever. You can do all these calculations as you would do in an Excel file, but just through queries. You can make the maps associated to this data. That is, it's a very strong analytic tool, potentially, because all the data is there, it's organized, and you just need yourself to think about what you want. And uh, it's automated. And this is about the end of the presentation for the tool. I just, uh, so this was just a work, I just wanted to add a few warning issues on the heritage recording, uh, which I found in Jeddah, actually you recognize Jeddah. Uh, it's very useful in the case of uh, uh, emergency issues to have this kind of tool because it can, with a very limited amount of time, you can do a lot of, collect a lot of information, and it's immediately saved in uh, different servers, wherever you want. Uh, it can be saved online because it's accessible through the web, so that means nobody can actually interfere with the data that you preserve if you decide so. And therefore, it's also very useful for cases of war, in the cases of uh, conflicts, or even if there's any kind of issues or problems, you can do things very fast for tangible heritage like that, but also for intangible, uh, you can record people, and also for uh, movable objects, all the pieces for illicit traffic, for example. We discuss at the moment with iChrom uh, for the illicit trafficking to develop a similar tool um, based on this one, deck actually, but there are different, now we're not the only ones doing similar now it's been in the in the, the wage, but it's I'm not presenting our own tool as idea. I'm talking about the process. So, but it's this one has been developing th incrementally through different projects, and it's uh, it's proved very useful and handy. If, yes. So in Jeddah, I wanted to avoid. No, sorry, I have to go. No. Yes, emergency issues were about, this was about the waging of the problems. You see a lot of damaged places like that, and you can still record them very handily, and you have to know that even in cases like that, uh, there, is, there are ways to restore buildings like that without uh, rebuild in a proper way if you have the data available from the inventories. If you don't have the inventory, if you don't have the data, at one moment or another, there is no way to reinvent the thing. So whatever documentation, documentation is a key issue uh, for now, but also for, unfortunately, also in the past. That's why the collection of the data in the project is very important. Uh, yes, I went too far. This was uh, just uh, something to avoid. You know, at one moment when you don't have heritage anymore, you have to mock the heritage and to pretend that you have some heritage. And this is for the festival uh, in Jeddah, and they were actually you see building decors to complete the pieces which had been damaged and lost. Uh, many reasons, obvious. There is no way you can replace the original heritage by something like that. I thank you very much. And thank you, Christian, for this very exciting presentation and many, many questions, I'm sure will come up now. And uh, Fadil is here as well. Could I open uh, the floor up for questions, please, uh, from the audience? Um, any questions for both Fadil and for Christian? Thank you. Uh, they're both clearly very powerful tools for, for recording uh, in detail, recording quickly. Um, I mean, my question, I guess, is about interpretation, where the interpretation fits in there, and archaeologists still draw. We're one of the very few professions that actually still hand-draw things. Um, and certainly to me, that's a very integral part of the recording process. Uh, you, you have to draw it, sorry, you have to, you have to draw it to, to see it. Um, so I guess the question for both of you is, did you see any place for hand-drawing in, in this recording of heritage? Hello, yeah, thanks, uh, Dan. I think hand drawings can still be there. We used it at, uh, when we started working on the project. We could not move away from it because you can take uh, some quick records. Still, for accuracy, 
technology cannot be replaced, like for the 3D scanner. It's true, it might take you a lot of time to treat the data, to analyze it, to filter and use what, what's needed. But I think, what do you mean by hand drawing nowadays? We can use tablet to draw, and it's digitized hand drawing. Uh, we, we can, but the technology That's is still not there, necessarily. I mean, so I guess the question is, I, I mean, I've been, something I've been working on also, but how, how you integrate that process of hand drawing and tablets in, into the recording process and... I mean, I, I, I see it, it can be integrated, but I believe that at a certain time we might not need it anymore. Um, and that's in my belief. I mean, I, I think otherwise. I think that we need the uh, hand drawings on the side, but I, uh, on this issue, I mean, I'm talking about the inventory now first, that the beam, I will, might have a comment, but it's a, the beam. Ha you have to understand that the beam. It's a different level of uh, detail, and basically the beam that was mentioned before. It's well. I'm going to talk about it later, but it's a very detailed work where you very accurate and it's very heavy, and you don't do it for a huge amount of data. You do it for one specific building that you want to restore, and you want to analyze to the level of the elements, singular elements. I mean, even a frame of a window on the beam level three, for example, that was mentioned, is not made with one element. It's not. It's four elements. The four wood pieces that build the frame are individually recorded and named and tagged and so on. And you can follow up the state of this place of these elements. So it's very. We're not talking about. Uh, the regular daily maintenance uh, of a regular building. We're talking about uh, heavy, in very important things. Uh, and also it's, um, well, and regarding the question of the inventory for the drawings, I mean, we basically, we saw very easily that drawings, you, you take a paper, you still need your paper with you, even to sketch things and add some information on the sketch by hand. We tried to implement some sketching uh, um, devices on, from the tablets. Uh, for example, we had in Palestine, we used, uh, uh, we, monit we monitored the pictures through uh, a sketch device which allowed us to write on the pictures. You can take the pictures with the tablet within the survey and sketch on it. You can put the arrow, circle the area where you want to point the path pathology. You can use different color codes and say, we, we, we tried all this, it worked. Uh, there was, in the, in the in, at this stage, there was one issue but which needs to be corrected for us, which was that uh, when we published the pictures, it was distorting them to the same format. So they were right to record the place uh, and the legend was right, but the picture itself was shrewd a little bit. So it's not, it still needs to be adapted. But in general, all these tools are in the way to be used. And it still doesn't replace the drawing, the sketches, and usually what we did, before we went on site, we were doing some sketches uh, from the drawings that we had at hand or the pictures to identify the different spaces. And sometimes on site, you need some drawings and you take a picture of the drawing and you assign it to the file. And when you go home, you can replace, which they did for some of them, they wanted to have nice drawings, perfect. Even though they were carrying the same amount of information, they wanted to have AutoCAD drawings. So they took AutoCAD, redid the drawings they had done on site, took pictures of the AutoCAD drawing of the print, and added the picture, uh, the AutoCAD drawing to the, f the file. So that's everything is still possible. It's handy, but it's uh, yes, this uh, connection between the automated process and the file is just taken by pictures. It's uh, done like that. I'm, I think I will debate this, and beam is not a tool, it's a process, it's, it's a procedure. And drawings could be part of this whole process. So uh, for now we were seeing, I'm not against hand drawing, I'm an architect, I have to sketch. It's a step in developing any process, either designing or re restoring this or recording. But nowadays, because we have technology, you are using a tablet. So why you don't you use a paper to take your sketches? Yeah, so we, we have to live with our time. We have to use technology to the benefit of, of what we are doing, to the, the needs. And uh, it's not only the beam, it's the 3D scanning, which is very important. When we record something, we have to record it at 
high percentage of accuracy. We cannot reproduce what's existing um, real life, the building in itself or the element. It could be a window, it could be the whole library. It has to be scanned, it has to be recorded. Nowadays, it's, it's the opposite. Sketching is becoming, or hand, hand drawing is becoming a support to other tools. We have to accept it. And this will help us because it's quick, it's fast. But doing the scanning or other means, photogrammetry, they have a pros and cons. I have another lecture, it's, it's quite long, where we analyze different means of recording not only buildings, but different types. And that's why this 3D scanning is used in, in, in accident scenes because it is very accurate. And if you want to record what we need, and, uh, and uh, for the window thing, you have to be accurate if you want to record. You know, there are, there are studies just about the capital, you know, if it's a Doric, if it's a Corinthian, and this is very important. There were things we could not see with the eye. They are happening with the, we are over the pixel, now we are on the voxel level. So it's the point of the 3D. This is very important. And I don't know, maybe we, we have to move forward. We have to accept those things. We are not de deleting what we had. Uh, in my last slide, we have to understand we should use technology to keep the tradition. Thank you very much. Uh, back. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, I have two questions, actually. First, in the presentation regarding the HBIM, so you mentioned that it can predict the future of the building 10 years, 10 years from now, right? So um, can you elaborate further on how you uh, do the process? Because I think, like, scanning the building alone is not enough. What are the additional data that you need to gather or um, um, and the process, or you ca can you give an example which um, using this process, predicting the future of a certain building, aid um, in the um, master planning, or because I think this is very helpful for a certain um, city to do the master planning properly. Um, and second, on the Second presentation, did you encounter like privacy issues? But like, um, uh, do you get permission from the um, residents or, because with the data we are gathering right now, you presented that it's very good, like during war, you can give the um, emer emergency route, but of course data, the use of data depends on the person. So. What if that data is used on a negative way? So did, did you encounter certain privacy issues or there are um, residents who complained about it? Uh, should I give it to you? Yes, t t thank you for uh, your questions. Very interesting. The predictions or estimating the span of life of a building, it's not through it's, it's part of the beam, either for HBM or normal beam. It's where you do the life cycle assessment. So you can plug in certain evaluations. It could be the building performance. While conducting the survey, you can monitor cracks. And through the development of those cracks, I'm talking about historic buildings, which are vulnerable, you can estimate the duration on at what level the cracks would expand at a level that this could make the building collapse and you can treat it. I think the time of the Mshirab when they displaced four villas, four, ho four houses, they used this technology and they were using very precise sensors to assess the disturbance based on the waves on when they, they, they moved the buildings and then they brought them back. So doing this, you can monitor the life cycle of the building and it goes to parametric, I would say. So if a parameter would change how this would affect the lifespan of the building. By knowing this, you can provide the remedy before it gets too late. And that's why this uh, beam or H-beam is very useful, because it can give you uh, an advance. It's, it's like a medical doctor. Knowing well, diagnosing well the, the issues related to your building can help you provide the right uh, remedy or the right medicine. I'm not sure if this answers your question. 
if I may complement this, uh, this is, uh, all this is very important. I think the, the key word related to BIM was not, maybe we didn't insist too much, is the maintenance. It's basically the BIM is mostly a, a tool, the, the, the big improvement is the fact that it can process, you can process the maintenance of the building at the moment when you register it. And uh, it's also re it's related to the diagnosis of the pathologies, as mentioned, but it's also related to the new elements. When you build new, the big new buildings like this one, for example, when it was built, they probably ask for a beam to be done because in the beam you associate a duration uh, to all the elements. And each of these elements that you see has a life duration uh, sold by the, fab the builder. And when you build a wooden window or, for example, at the time, PVC windows used to have a 20 years duration. And all the calculations at one moment in north of Europe were proven, proved that the, replace, the energy saving uh, of replacing these wooden windows by PVC windows uh, in terms of costs for the energy was less uh, you, you could you would you were spending more money uh, less in less money in energy uh, with the wooden window than replacing the pvc window and this is something that happened a long time ago now with the beam it's automatic you could now you would say immediately i mean p windows have changed of course but i mean at the time you would have found immediately with the beam that it was not interesting to replace the wooden window with a pvc window because you need to change the PVC before you actually make the money that you save on the energy. And so it didn't make sense. Coming back to the issue uh, of uh, the people, of course. I mean, I was my, uh, yes, you were definitely right. It's a very important issue. And it's, uh, that's why you don't do an inventory without the local staff or local people sometimes being in touch with the people. You need to access as much as possible the inside of the buildings, for example, in the case of the inventories. Uh, the survey we did in Asamoa was only possible because we had the municipality with us and the people of the municipality sometimes they had to make contact with the families and sometimes uh, the families would not agree because they were in the process of a fight with the municipality because of the building permit because of whatever and sometimes you don't access and you, can, you have to deal with that and sometimes you have to guess from the outside what is inside you have to make assumptions and that's part of the process, yes. And it's never completely accessible, yes. And sometimes you had nice discussions with the ladies there, selling dresses, traditional dresses, uh, inside their own homes, and it was nice as well, yes. Um, thank you. I'm very mindful of the time because uh, we are we have eaten into the tea time. So uh, if we can continue this discussion, which has raised some interesting questions, if we can continue that in the while having tea, it'll be fantastic. Thank you again, Christoph and Fadel, for this very interesting and very relevant discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.